Good morning. My name is Neil Bubke, and I'd like to invite you to stand and join me in the call to worship. Welcome, friends, to this holy day. We come to offer thanks. We come to sing and pray. Welcome, friends, to this time set apart. A time to remember the holy promises of God. Welcome, friends, to this table of remembrance and joy. The table where we are fed, the feast we share with many. Welcome, friends, and let us worship God. I welcome you. My name is Matt Hadley. I am the senior pastor here at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay. And whether you are uh, tuning in live on such a beautiful day outside, or if you're going to wait for the weather to uh, turn and you're receiving this uh, later in the week, I'm so happy to be able to spend this time with you in worship. There is a number on your screen if you would like to text in any items of joy or concern, um, even though we are separated from one another. We are still a community of faith bound together, and we want to lift people up in our prayers. And so please uh, feel free to send those. And again, if you want it to be anonymous, just write anonymous um, so that Neil won't read uh, the name that you don't want read. I also would like to welcome again those folks that are not usually a part of our community of faith, but during this safer at home time of this pandemic, you have been worshiping with us each week. What a pleasure it is and a privilege, really, to help walk with you in these difficult times. I want you to find some kind of bread. It can be any kind of bread or a cracker and some kind of juice or wine. We are going to be receiving communion together today uh, virtually, and so I, I hope you can uh, take part in that with us. Well, we have uh, uh, Miss Christie is here to lead us with our children, children's ministry, and so I'm going to invite Christy to come on up and speak to our young ones at home. Good morning, how are you? Today, Pastor Matt's gonna be talking about how we feed ourselves. Now, there's two ways you can get fed. You should be eating delicious, healthy food to help you grow strong and have lots of energy, but we also need to feed our souls. We need to fill ourselves full of God's love and God's word, and so we asked our families, how do you feed yourselves, both body and soul? Listen and see what some of our friends said. Do you know what 
one of my favorite healthy foods is? What? An apple. You know what goes great with that? What? Bible study. Really? Right. My favorite healthy food is dove chocolate. A dove represents peace, and peace is in the Bible. I pray before bed so I have good dreams and everyone has good, good dreams. So as you can see, there are a lot of ways to feed yourselves. One of the ways that our family fed our soul was yesterday we went for a hike. And while we were out walking in the woods and listening to the wind and the trees, we talked about how beautiful the woods were and how amazing it was that God had created that for us. I hope that you spend some time talking to your family today. How are you feeding your soul? What could you do to continue to feed your soul? I love you. I'll see you soon. I hope that video worked and was a blessing to you. I saw the video a little bit earlier and, and it brought a smile to my face as we incorporate all the generations that we have here at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay. But we do come now to a time for prayer and we have a call to prayer that we use during our traditional service. And so the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. And so we turn to God in a time of silent and listening prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and generous God, creator of all, birth giver of spring, of sun and warmth, of budding flowers and trees, of the green earth and the blue seas. We give you thanks for the many blessings flowing from you to us, like a basket of new hope, new life. Gracious and generous God, creator of all, pouring your love into Christ Jesus, your steadfast promise of love, of hope to us, our faith. May we hear your words calling us to be your body. And now, God of all communities everywhere, hear the prayers of this community of faith. A prayer for Betty Brandt and our friends without a way to receive worship services. Yet are continually fed from their soul. Bless them. Prayers for complete healing for Lynn Raffensperger. Prayers for Jill, that her sepsis resolves so she can have open heart surgery this week. May her surgery be successful. A prayer of thanksgiving, getting through this challenging time together in love. A prayer request for an uncle suffering from terminal brain cancer. And from Lin that's from Lindsay Vandenplass. Praise God for his holy and beautiful creation, this beautiful spring and our online worship. Prayers for a negative COVID test result. Prayers for a cousin Robert, for healing of his body and mind. And finally, prayers for Samantha's friend Mary, who lost her mom last night, and for a brother who's struggling to stay alive. These are the prayers of our people. Gracious and generous God, merciful lover of souls, tend to those who grieve, we pray for the suffering of this world of body, mind, and spirit. May your healing love embrace the pain, holding it with tender care. Gracious and generous God, merciful lover of souls, take our worries, 
in the brokenness of the world and heal it as only you are able. Speak into our lives and show us the way, the way to be your love. Gracious and generous God, giver of all good gifts, we thank you for Jesus who came to give us life, an amazing, abundant life. We pray all this in his glorious name. Amen. And so we come to a time where we are reminded that we are called to be faithful stewards of all that God has given us. There are a variety of ways that you can continue to support our mission and ministry here as we seek to have impacts far beyond these walls. There is a text option on the screen. You can also send your checks or have uh, direct deposits made here. And as I've been saying, if you are a member of another church but have been worshiping with us, support your local church so that when the doors can open up again, the ministry can be alive and vibrant there. So let us be cheerful givers. God, we give you thanks for the number of ways in which you bless us. And so, Lord, what an honor and a privilege it is to be stewards of that and to give it forward that real areas of need might be met. Continue to bless all that we seek to do. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask this. Amen. And so we have one more hymn. Uh, for uh, us this day that's going to pre help prepare us to receive this word. And this is one of the hymns I really, really enjoy. Uh, Take time to be holy.
fountains of love, thou soon shalt be fitted for service above. Well, we are in the second week of a very brief, just two-week-long sermon series called Weed and Feed. It's that time of year, springtime, where we are wanting our lawns that have made it through winter to, to come in, to be lush, to be green, to not have any dandelions or thistles or, or any of that kind of stuff. I, I've been seeing people weeding and feeding for the last couple of weeks. How, what, a, what a beautiful day it is today, and that grass is, is starting to explode and to pop. But before we get to the sermon, I want to kind of give us a roadmap of where we're going to be going for the next uh, eight weeks. Next week is Mother's Day, and we're going to have a service that honors our mothers, but the focus is actually going to be on the generations that have gone before us, our grandmothers, generations of strong women, women who have made us who we are. And then I'm going to begin uh, a seven-week sermon series. I, I've been going through my books to try and see, okay, if I haven't read this book in a long, long time, does it really need to take up shelf space in my office? Kind of a decluttering, a, a weeding of the library. And I came across a book by Zan Holmes. And many of you who took the Disciple Bible Study, the Red Book, way back in the days where it was on the VHS tape, Zan Holmes was the narrator. He was the host. But he wrote this great little short book called Encountering Jesus. And so that's what we're going to explore, encountering Jesus, the kind of encounters that really matter, and there's no encounter that matters more than encountering Jesus. But we're going to see that we encounter Jesus in the Bible, we encounter Jesus in worship, we encounter Jesus in and through a sermon, we encounter Jesus in the life of a church, in the life of a community, we encounter Jesus in the ways in which we seek justice. And then I'm going to wrap it all up. And I'm, I'm wondering, I, I looked at my calendar. This is going to come to a conclusion at the end of June. Will we all be able to worship together as a family by the end of June? But let's come back to this short little sermon series based on the parable of the sower. And that's a very familiar parable. Many of us know it very, very well. There is a farmer, and this is the farmer God. God is the farmer in this. And he goes out to cast his seed, to sow the seed. And so he would have had a bag of some sort filled with the seed, and he just casts it. He throws it around, and we experience God as a God of abundance, casting the word everywhere to everyone available to all. But we heard last week that some of the seed didn't fall on good soil, it fell on a path. And it was trampled underfoot by people coming and going. Birds of the air came down and, and started to eat the seed. We know that some of that seed found its way to rocky places and it withered because there was no opportunity in the rock to have any kind of root system. But last week our focus was on the 14th verse of the 8th chapter of Luke. The seed that fell among the thorns, among the, the weeds, stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. And so we had a, a three-point sermon last week, the worries. You know, people filled with such anxiety, such a lack of trust. They never experience any peace, the deep relationship with the God of creation, of salvation, of sustenance is absent. Some are, are worried about the riches. They have a scarcity mentality, this, this need to hoard, and others by the pleasures. And we talked about that being an obsession with me, myself, and I, the narcissism that is so rampant in our society. But the lesson was, unless we tend to the soil of our soul, Weeds, thistles, thorns will choke our spiritual lives. And so I put out a call, don't water your weeds. And so today we wrap this up with focusing on feeding our spiritual soil. 
And so the 15th chapter, the last, uh, or the 15th verse of the 8th chapter, the last verse in this parable says, But as for that in the good soil, these are the ones who, when they hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patient, patient endurance. And so the question that I hope you'll wrestle with today is, what's growing in your garden? I mean, what is it that you are feeding? What is growing in your garden? Is it the right thing? I think we would all be surprised if we thought we were planting sweet corn, and indeed did plant sweet corn. Instead, pumpkins came up. It's a natural law that you reap what you sow. Every action has a result. If you gossip about your friends, if that's what you're sowing, you're going to lose those friends. What you're going to reap is life alone. And just as an aside, if you have a friend who gossips to you, they will, I promise you, gossip about you. You reap what you sow. This is what Paul said to the church in Galatia. From Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you will reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right. For we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. And I want to pause right there. Remember that, that parable said, patient endurance, not giving up. We continue, so then whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Almost four years ago, I had a staff meeting, and, and I was still very much the new guy, and I think the staff was still a little unsure as to what kind of a pastor I might be. Maybe some of you were, were really nervous. What kind of a pastor are we gonna, did the bishop send to us uh, this time? But I had a check-in question, and so I asked the staff, what is it that feeds you? What is it that truly feeds your soul? And they came up with four things. And these are four things that, that maybe do feed your soul. Music, absolutely, is music feeds my soul. Prayer, but then community and family. How would you answer that? What feeds your soul? Not what feeds your belly. We have a statement in our language that says, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Some of us are getting close to the COVID-19 pounds because we're, we're kind of locked in. But I was reading on the internet that a scientist has computed that the average human being eats 16 times their weight over the course of a year. 16 times. You can do the math on that. But in comparison, a horse eats only eight times their weight over the period of that year. So I guess it stands to reason that if we want to lose weight, we might want to consider not eating a horse, but eating like a horse. What feeds your soul? Not what feeds your ego. As Wayne Dyer said, you can either be a host to God or a hostage to your ego. It's your call. What is it that feeds your soul? Not what feeds your greed. As one has said, greed is a bottomless pit which exhausts the person in an endless effort to satisfy the need without ever reaching satisfaction. No, friends, wrestle with this question. What is it that truly feeds your soul? And then ask, how much of it am I getting? If it feeds your soul, how much of it are you getting? What are the things that draw you close to God? What activities, what practices, what disciplines quiet your soul as it feeds it? Are you prioritizing them? You see, food for the body is not enough. There must be food for the soul, and there is no amount of good food that can nourish a starving soul. So what are you feeding your spiritual garden? Now, four years ago, after that staff meeting, I stood before the congregation on a Sunday, and I declared that it is the church that feeds us, and we are fed the bread of life and the living water and indeed, as this sermon comes to an end this morning, we're going to receive the bread of life and the cup of blessing for the forgiveness of sins. 
but we know that the world is full of starving bellies and empty souls. And we need to remember that the church has always been fed by feeding others. What feeds your soul? And so let me lift up to you this morning two things. Two things that are necessary to have your soul be fed. And for those of you who like a three-point sermon, I hope you don't feel cheated that we're just going to talk about two things here. And those two things are practices and people. Practices and people. The staff said music and prayer. Prayer, a practice. Here at the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay, we say we love God, we care for each other, and we serve in the world. Loving and caring and serving, those are spiritual practices. But it is this prayer. Prayer is the heart's true home. And if you want to have a life-giving relationship with anybody, you have to communicate with them. I love my wife, Janet, dearly. And I love speaking with her. And although she may say, I wish you did it more, I love listening to her. You know, if, if we didn't communicate at all, our relationship wouldn't be as vibrant as it is now. So too with God, you need to communicate with God. You need to listen for the divine whisper, listen for the holy nudges. We need to lift other people up through our prayers of intercession. Prayer is the heart's true home. And you'll never be at home with God if you don't communicate with God. But there's also the practice of worship. And thanks be to God for the people who continue to come here on Sundays and, and lead us. Never more than 10, but we are led. It is worship. Worship. On Wednesday night, hopefully many of you were able to, to tune in at 7.30 for an event that we called The Community Sings. We asked the congregation to put out their favorite songs and their favorite hymns, and we had ourselves a concert here. To me, that felt like worship, worship. I hope you have prayers of thanksgiving for the way in which our, our tech team makes sure that we're able to stay connected even through this, this media. Yes, we love, we care, we serve, we pray, we worship, but are we actually seeking after God by embracing God's holy word. You see, this book, this book has every human experience in it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so I'm here to tell you, don't live a day without your spiritual nourishment. Meditate on the word of God. And so those are all pretty predictable. You'd say, yeah, Pastor Matt, love, care, serve, pray, worship, read the Bible. But what about this stewardship Thing. You see, we have come together and said we are going to offer to God our time, our treasure, and our talent. I had a, a wonderful conversation this week with one of the young men of this community of faith. He's, he's been worshiping here since the day he was born, Nicholas Hatch. I know many of you know, know Nicholas and the Hatch family. And uh, he's a student at UWM right now. And he's taking a course called Communications in Organizations. And he wanted to interview me, and so he said, I am researching the church and looking for ways to connect it to leadership. I'm trying to research how the church is a leader in the community. And he had about 20 questions lined out. Incredibly sharp kid, and, and he, he was a good interviewer. We had a, a great exchange. But the conversation came to what are the expectations of membership? What are the practices that people who join this church have taken a vow that they are going to do. Friends, vows are very important. We stood before a community of faith and we took these vows, these vows to faithfully participate in the life and the ministries of our local church through, through these things, through prayers, through presence, through gifts, through service. Now, depending on when you took your membership, that's where it used to end. But even since I've been in ministry, there has been a fifth one added. We have taken a vow to participate through our witness. Now, that makes a lot of people very nervous, that whole witness thing. And I have time and time again said, do you have your elevator speech of, of why you believe, why you believe, why you have faith? 
And I tell you that if you really can answer that question in 15 to 30 seconds, it's going to be amazing how often God is going to put you in a position where you can uh, d defend your faith, let people know why you believe. Now, some of you might say, oh, I don't, I don't want that. I don't want anyone to ever ask me that question. But friends, we need to be able to have a, a statement of faith. A statement of faith. Why is it that I believe? And so, friends, check yourselves. Weed that out of your life that is keeping you from praying, from being present, from offering gifts, and being in service and witnessing to the world. The first thing that we do to feed our soul is through our practices, our spiritual disciplines. But the second thing that, that feeds our soul is people. You see, four years ago, the staff said, the community of faith, the family, people. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus loved people, all people, and still does. One of my favorite people here in, in this community of faith, the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay, is a guy named Jake Jacobson. That Jake is a treat. He is just a joy. And Jake uh, has celebrated his 100th birthday, and, and they had a big party down there at East Castle, and they gave him a throne. He was kind of king for a day. And he saw all these faces of family and friends and, and, and just wonderful celebration for his 100th birthday. But I was talking with Jake on the phone this week, just calling to see how, how he's doing. You know, is he feeling kind of trapped in his his own room, and, and he talked about how important faces are, the faces of people. What a joy it is for him to walk downstairs each day to, to get the mail and to see the faces of the other residents, to see the faces of the, the staff. And he wrote an article for their, their newsletter about the power of seeing faces. People feed our soul. I was reflecting on that this week as I was writing an article for our newsletter, our May's edition of The Joy, and the article was titled, The Building is Closed, The Church is Open. And in it, I said, I am not going to lie. I miss people. For those of you who know me best, this comes as no surprise. I'm what is known as an extrovert, an extrovert. Craig Walker's daughter said to him, you know, if you have friends who are extroverts, call them because they're not okay with this isolation, with this safer at home. But as I think about it, one of my spiritual practices, one of the things that feeds my soul more than almost all others is gathering together as a group and worshiping our God. You know, the choir members have the same advantage I do. I get to look out and I get to see all of your faces as we worship together. That's what I'm missing. As I look out right now, there is nobody in the sanctuary, in the pews. There is a doll that is up in the balcony with the head right above the camera so that I have something to kind of focus on. But I miss people. I miss worshiping together. I miss the interaction. I miss the feedback. I have no idea if I'm connecting with you you know, I, I love to preach just with an outline and to walk back and forth to try and engage different sections of the sanctuary. And now I am stuck here for sight lines, to having to stay in between these two candles so that our camera can convey it and come right into your living room. I read an article this week in the, the Christian Century, and uh, she... Uh, in this article, Melissa Floor Bixler, she wrote this, uh, I'm not getting used to this. There's no way I can get used to this, this isolation. I get it. I, get, I am lucky. I, I do get to see faces. At the 9 o'clock service the last couple of weeks, there's even been a new face. I'm not alone. Melissa and I are not alone. It, this goes back. If we read the scripture, we read the Apostle Paul and we read some of his letters that talk about this longing to see other people. To Timothy, he writes, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. And to the church in Rome, he wrote, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Well, in her article, she said she's never going to be able to get used to this. 
You see, as I was reading it, I see that she and I both feel that our spiritual practices, those things that draw us closer to God, involve others. And so she asked this question, what do you do when people, your sustaining spiritual practice, are taken away? What do you do when your sustaining spiritual practice is taken away? And so it's, it's natural that we have a collective grief at this time, that we have a common frustration, that there's a common sentiment in the air even as it is being broken down along partisan lines. At a Zoom meeting with the conference this week, you know, they said people are going to be experiencing a form of PTSD from this. Some people are going to have a real hard time ever moving forward. And that breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. Now, I was hoping to see a bunch of faces this week. We had said that we had purchased um, hundreds of, of pre-packed communion kits, you know, with a, a, a sealed wafer on top of a sealed cup, and that nobody was going to be able uh, to touch it other than the person who was going to receive it, that we were going to have uh, spaces six feet apart out there on our sidewalk. And, and today is so beautiful, it would have been fantastic. I was going to wear a mask, and I was going to wear gloves, and I know that made some people very nervous, and I understand that. I understand that. But I had conversations this week with the, uh, the senior environmental health specialist from the North Shore Environmental Health Consortium, and I had a conversation with one of the sergeants at the Whitefish Bay Police Department, and they just wanted to make sure that we were going to do this the right way, and they both, both those groups, gave us the green light. It says, one of them said, all of this sounds appropriate, and another said, it appears that you are taking reasonable precautions to comply with Governor Evers safer at home requirements and so we did get word that they were shipped just on Thursday we'll probably get them Monday a day late but when they arrive we will send out word to give you an opportunity and of course if you're symptomatic or you're uncomfortable by no means do you need to come and be a part of that but I hope that you did find a piece of bread or a cracker and I hope that you have some kind of juice or some kind of of uh, wine that you can use. Because this sacrament of Holy Communion, this holy meal, feeds us in a way that, that no food really could. This feeds us in a way that, that lifts up our soul. We remember that on the night in which Jesus was ultimately betrayed, betrayed by one of the people who was closest to him, and yet he loved him still. He took one of the pieces of bread. It was the Seder meal, and, and he took that bread and he broke it, and he said something to them that I don't think they've heard him say before. This is my body given to you. Take and eat. And I think we just gloss over that statement far too often. This is my body, which is given to you. It is not taken away. I give it freely. And not just for the people who are in that room, for all of God's people, for the entire world. Remember, our God is a generous sower as he sows seed everywhere, the word of God everywhere. Now, at those Seder meals, there were containers of wine that held a very special purpose. And Jesus took one of the containers of wine, and he said a prayer of thanksgiving. And maybe we overlook that far too often as well. Jesus bathing everything in prayer. And then he said some words that I'm sure the disciples didn't quite understand just yet. This is the blood of the new covenant. You see, the sacrificial lambs had, had just been, been slaughtered. The blood had flowed. But here's Jesus saying, the blood of the new covenant. Do you remember what the prophet said? That God is not done? That God is going to do a new thing? And so they all had this messianic expectation that Jesus was a much different kind of king. And he said, as often as you drink it, remember me. 
Do it in remembrance of me. And so here this morning, myself in the sanctuary, you hopefully at home, whether it's live right now or later in the week if you're tuning in later, we we get to remember this. We get to be participants in this. And so I'm going to say a prayer of, of blessing to invite the Holy Spirit to be present in these, in these elements. And every time the Methodist Church offers communion, we, we let it be made known that the table is open. And so maybe you're watching this and you're really not a Methodist at all. Friends, you are invited. You are invited to come because this was for the entire world. And so let us pause for a word of prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking that our eyes might be open, that we might recognize the risen Christ in our midst, indeed in one another. Come, Holy Spirit, come. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And so with the confidence that we are your beloved children, we offer up the prayer that Christ himself has taught us in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And so I invite you to take your bread, the bread of life, and to receive. We have the cup of blessing for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink, and in doing so, remember him. Almighty God, we give you thanks. Thanks for the ways in which our practices can be food for our soul. Thank you for this meal, which is food for our soul. And we thank you for the people you have surrounded us with. They're a blessing to us. May we be a blessing to them. Amen. And so we have one more song to send us out into the world. Jesus, thine all-victorious love. I hope you sing out loud at home.
And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, find those things that nourish your spiritual journey. Find those things that are blessings to you so that you might be a blessing to those around you. Have a blessed week, and God be with you till we meet again. Amen. Thank you.